Thank you so much for doing this. You have no idea how much that means. And I hope everyone that is going to listen to this in the future will get a, a, great, a great idea about the Enneagram and hopefully be uh, it will be useful for them. It will be helpful for them. I'm sure it will. So, yeah, it's good to have you here. Vanessa Absolutely. Fernandez, did I say right? Yes, you got it. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. It's a very Latin name. Very Latin name. Soy Cubana. This is the multilingual podcast. Awesome. So, Vanessa, um, tell us a little bit about yourself, just like as an introduction, um, where you live, what do you do? Uh, I know what mm -hmm. you do, and I've had a look around uh, a few of your a few of the things that you recorded on your YouTube and everything, but just give us a brief idea of what you do and, and who you are, and then we jump straight into what we came to talk about today. Yeah. So I live in Miami, Florida, got four little ones that I am a mother to, and I do Enneagram coaching, uh, which basically just means that I take this system of the Enneagram, which is a personality archetype system that helps us understand what are the patterns that I've learned to make my way through the world. And then how does that influence how I show up? Sometimes it influences without me knowing it. And so how do I become conscious of that? in order to show up more fully and more consciously. So I use the Enneagram to coach individuals. I also do consulting work with corporations. I've worked with churches, um, just kind of helping people talk to each other rather than talk past each other mm. and helping people to um, understand who they are beneath the mask of who they think they have to be. Right. Because we always have this idea of like, well, I have to show up this way to be safe, to be seen, to be valued, to be uh, loved and accepted. And, and there's something deeper. So I help people uncover that. And uh, gosh, I just I love it. I've been doing it for about two and a half years. Prior to that, I was coaching in some other modalities. But Enneagram oh, really? is so you came from, my favorite from the whole coaching culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was actually a fitness and nutrition coach prior to doing Enneagram coaching. And it's kind of what led me into it because I was working with people to try and change their eating habits and their fitness. And, you know, you can only muscle your way through so far before people were hitting resistance. Mm -hmm. Like they knew all the right things to do. Sorry. They knew all the right things to do. They knew what they needed to eat and how they needed to work out, but they just couldn't make it happen. Mm. And so we started going a little bit deeper and I realized, oh, wait a minute, we're all running on these subconscious programs. We're all um, trying to, you know, change ourselves without really knowing who we are. And mm. so the changes that they were trying to make weren't being effective because they didn't understand who they were and the, the patterns and the programming that they were working off of. So then that led me into the Enneagram. And once I found the Enneagram, I was like, that's it. This is it. This is all I'm doing. <laughs> you know, this week, um, one of the guys that I was driving with, he he said, uh, but what's this Enneagram thing? Like most people have no clue what that is until they are shown uh, mm -hmm. what's that all about. And, and the way I could explain to him, obviously, I said, look, there's an interview coming up on the channel that you're going to love. So you should watch that. But uh, the way I could explain to him is that take any personality test that you have ever done, and then you multiply by 10 when it comes to the death of it. And then that's, mm -hmm. that's what yeah. I think the Enneagram is. So um, yeah. for, for the people who are going to be watching this in the future, maybe disconnected with your audience and maybe my audience, um, I, I'm passionate about the Ikigai, which is a different concept. And then I think in order for us to understand our purpose, it's a super helpful tool is to understand who we are and not just what we try to be, like you said. So that's why you're here. Yeah. Uh, that's why I, I invited you and to give you, to give props where props are due, like your channel is pretty much the best channel when it comes to Enneagram on YouTube. So everybody should check it out. The Enneagram workshop, it is the best. Like I've, I've researched and I've looked a lot of people up and a lot of stuff up. So yeah. Well, wow, that means a lot. That means a lot. Thank you. And hopefully people will, will find that content. So you, you said that when we had, you know, when we were preparing for this, you said, um, well, the best thing to do is to start with the, with the Enneagram types, you know, what it is and the types. So I want to give room to the specialists so you can, you can explain to people what they are and how we, you would do a brief introduction. And then we go to the yeah. later on. 
Yeah. So this is always a challenge because most teachers will take, I don't know, three days to go through each of the, you know, all of the nine types. I'm going to try to do it in like, I don't know, 15 minutes. <laughs> <You can> do, <laughs> do my I'm best. Sure do I can, I can. Um, but basically when you were saying that it's like, take any personality test and go 10 times deeper. The reason for that is because most personality tests are going to help you notice what you do. Oh, I'm an extrovert. Or I tend to, you know, make lists because I like to have control over whatever. I'm a control freak. What? So it looks at what you do. The Enneagram actually looks at why you do what you do. Why do I make lists every time that I need to get something done? Why am I the extrovert who is, you know, making everybody laugh at the party? I know that's what I do, but why do I do it? And when we know why we do it, uh, that's the only place from which we can make change. And that's the only place from which we can start understanding what, what kind of healing needs to take place. And what I mean by that is um, our types operate from this place of a defense mechanism. Right? So I can't just show up as I am and who I am. I need to have a defense mechanism. So I'm going to start there. I'm, I'm going to go through all the types and kind of speak to the defense mechanism of each type and why that came about. And I'm going to try to be quick. Oh. So we'll start with type one and type one, we call the perfectionist or the reformer. And they are oriented toward what is good and what is bad. Is the world good? Am I good? Is there something wrong with me? what, you know, they, they come in kind of judging black and white, good and bad. And judgment is not a bad thing. We have to judge in order to know, like, you know, is this hot or cold so that we're safe? Judging is not a bad thing. Noticing that we're judging is helpful mm. so that we can notice, you know, all right, I am judging, but I have to, but I want to be conscious of that. So ones are very good at judging what is right, what is wrong. The defense mechanism that they use is this thriving for constant improvement and perfectionism, right? So if I'm noticing what is good, what is bad, I want to be good. And so they're constantly trying to be better. They're constantly trying to make others better and their surroundings better. Um, and that's not a bad thing until it's the only thing that they can mm. focus on and do until there's no room for things just being what they are, mm. right? It's not bad to strive for improvement. Uh, um, but if I can't ever stop and rest and just be like, it is what it is, then I am enslaved to that compulsion for constant improvement. Right. And so that is, that is the type one. They are, they're striving toward perfection. And when they're healthy, they're able to rest and say, you know what? Good enough. At a certain point we say good enough. Mm. Uh, so now moving to type two, type two, we call the helper. Um, and type two is oriented toward, is there enough provision for everyone that I love, that I know is everyone going to be taken care of? Maybe there's not. And, and every type you're going to hear is questioning this lack. Is there a lack of goodness in the world for type ones? Well, then let me make things better for type twos. Is there a lack of provision in the world? Well, then I'll help. I'll be the helper. Mm -hmm. I'll take care of everyone. I'll fill the need that I perceive in the world. And this is, again, not a bad thing at all. We need helpers. Until the type two, their defense mechanism is they say, I don't have any needs. Everyone else has needs. Mm -hmm. So I will neglect, suppress, turn my back on my own needs and prioritize everyone else's needs. And again, it sounds really nice and really generous. The problem is twos are still human. Mm -hmm. To deny their own humanity uh, creates this rupture within their hearts, their hearts are broken because they're caring for everyone else. They're not caring for themselves. And then it, it becomes a problem, mm. right? Then they're not, they're not caring from a place of truth, selfless love. They're caring from a place of compulsion, just like the one is making things better from that place of compulsion. That's never a healthy place to be. So that is the type two type three is we call the achiever, um, the performer. I lead with type three. Uh, and threes, they're striving. They, they want to know what is valuable in the world. What are we, what are we going after? What do we value? Where do we find worth? Why does, why do things matter? 
Um, and so threes are trying to create value because they don't believe that there is inherent value. Again, it's like this lack. There's not enough goodness. There's not enough provision. There's not enough value. I'm going to create it. So threes try to perform and become who they think everyone else wants them to be. Threes can start to shape shift. Oh, oh, this, this party needs a, you know, a funny guy. I'll be the funny guy. Oh, this um, project needs me to be really disciplined. I'll be really disciplined. The thing is they lose themselves as they try to shape shift into what they think everyone else wants them to be. And what's interesting about all of these defense mechanisms, n nobody's really conscious that we're doing this. Mm. Like if you were to ask me, Hey, are you trying actually just the other day? One of my friends who's a type eight who calls me on all my, all my stuff. She was like, Hey, are you trying to do that? Cause you're trying to impress, you know, this other person who I was telling, telling her how I was trying to like figure out how to create this, this experience that I wanted to create. And I was like, no, 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 no. I'm not trying to impress them. I'm just, you know, this is just important to me. And then I had to sit and take a breath. And I was like, nope, I'm trying to impress them. Mm. It, it, it's not a conscious thing until we slow down and sink in and say, yeah, that's exactly what I'm doing. That's my defense mechanism. I don't even notice it. So the three is, is constantly stuck in this overachieving. Um, it helps when you have and, people to call you out on it. <laughs> oh, you need it. You, one of my favorite things about Enneagram work is that it's not something you could do by yourself mm. because you can't see what's right in front of your face, yeah. right? It, it's, it's so close. There's no, there's no way to do it yourself. And, and like you said, we've um, been programmed, you know, there's a subconscious mm -hmm. program. So we, we see what we see because we've been programmed to see it that way. So mm -hmm. someone that sees it differently. Mm -hmm. our attention. I think that at least this is what I understand so far, but yeah. I'm loving it already because I yeah. identified the number two in my life. My wife is mm -hmm. a number two, clearly. Yep. Yep. She's always trying to help everybody and, and she's not taking care of herself. So yeah, this is really good. I, I want to know how yeah. I deal with the number two, but we'll get to that point. <laughs> oh man, the, the type two and the type eight uh, is such a common pairing that you see in relationships. Really? So it does not surprise me at all that you're, wow. that you're paired up with the two. Oh yeah, for sure. For sure, because it's a good balance. You you guys will you guys balance each other out. Okay. Um, good to know. Number four, we call the romantic or the individualist, and they are striving to feel unique and and that they have purpose. And so they're trying to find what makes me different from everyone else. Because if I'm different from everyone else, then I have significance, and then I have a purpose in the world. Right? If if I have a thousand of something, then I don't really need a thousand of something. But if I have one, mm -hmm. then I need it. So this uniqueness that fours are searching for um, is to know that they have significance in the world. And again, as with all the other types, every person is naturally significant, just like every person naturally has value and every person is provided for and every person has goodness within them. So they're searching for something that they think is missing, but it's actually not. Yeah. And as they search for this, they try to almost find their significance in their brokenness, right? So they, they tend to over focus on the tragedy of them not being enough, the tragedy of them being different, the tragedy of them being special, unique, um, not like everyone else. And there's something beautiful there because they see the things that we miss. They notice all the little details that we miss, um, but then also they can get stuck in some of the minutia, right? If all I am looking for is how I am different and broken, then that's all I will see of myself. When in reality, we contain both broken parts and we contain beautiful, whole, um, powerful parts as well. So with all of the types, it's really a matter of what am I focusing on and what do I not see because I'm overly focusing on this one part of reality. So for fours, it's, it's what makes me different. And usually it's because there's something wrong with me. And then they kind of churn into that, um, for a while. Mm. Uh, now moving to type fives, fives are the observer. They are also like this independent thinker. So they use their heads to analyze everything. They want to understand the world. They're craving clarity. Like what is going on? I want to know. And so they, they try to get this clarity by detaching from the world. So it's almost like if you're in a busy place and you're sitting off to the side and you're people watching because you're not a part of the hustle and the bustle of the cafe that you're in, you can see clearly because you're kind of detached, mm -hmm. you're pulled away and you get to observe from a distance. 
So that's the strategy that fives use is they detach and they try to find clarity through observation. Where this becomes overdone and a compulsion is that we can't fully know something until we engage. Mm -hmm. I can watch you eat a delicious yeah. steak, but until I taste it, I don't really know what it is and what well, it tastes like. It. Yes. And so fives can become overly dependent on their intellect and on observing, and they miss out on the engagement, mm -hmm. actually being in the world. Um, and they do this from a place of fear, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm afraid to engage because then it's messy. Uh, what if it becomes overwhelming? Is it true? Like you're going to jump into number six, but um, you've described five types of personality so far. Mm -hmm. There are nine on the Enneagram and, and I can see myself being a little bit of all of them. Yes. In different circumstances. Yes. Is, is, is that accurate or is that something wrong with my head? What, what goes on if people are thinking the same thing? What, how, how do you explain it? Yeah, absolutely. So all of these defense mechanisms we engage with, what happens is we find one that becomes our dominant, mm -hmm. that is like our first go-to. And if that one doesn't work, we will go to other defense mechanisms, right? Like if I'm trying to overwork as a type three and be impressive and I can't, I might pull back like a type five and just observe what's going on. Because obviously like I missed something, I wasn't able to use my primary defense mechanisms. So I default to some of the secondary. So yes. Um, and I am blowing over them at such a surface level. It's hard to really get into the meat yeah, of, of each type. And when you really get into the meat of each type, I'm, I don't know if this was your experience, but at least for me, it like hit me right in the chest. I was just like, oh, that's my type. Like that's my core type. The other types I'm like, yeah, I do that. Sometimes I want to help people and be perfectionist. And then when I heard the type three in its entirety, I was just like, oh, that's <laughs> it. Right. Like it just, it hits different. Yeah. I think the more you study, the more you, you, you try mm -hmm. to find out, you know, peculiarities in, in, in each one of them. And then you go like, oh, but I think I'm, I'm more this way or more that way. Yeah. Like I, yeah. I'm pretty sure I'm a number eight, like my primary one. And mm -hmm. I try to classify myself as a eight one seven. And then mm -hmm. every now and again, I think, mm, you know, I'm being too perfectionist. And that's my number mm -hmm. one playing out on me. So yeah. 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 yeah I, I, I feel your pain. I see where you're coming from. Yeah. And, and truly what, how it's meant to be used. The Enneagram is, is a map for um, wholeness and growth. And we really should be able to embody the strategies of all the nine types. And what happens is we kind of latch on to one strategy and overuse it. As people mature, it's harder to figure out what their type is because they've realized I yeah. can't just use this one tool, right? Like a hammer is a great tool, but if I use a hammer for every job, yeah. it's not an effective choice. I want to have multiple tools. So the types, if you can think of them as multiple tools, we get really good at one, but eventually we get tired of that it's same a, story. Everything you have in your hand is a hammer. Everything you see is going to be a nail. Yes. 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 Oh, that's so it. there's a concept called right action, which is the ability to be with what is not with what I'm afraid that might be not with what I'm projecting that might be not with my insecurities, but to be with what is. And as I am with what is, what emerges is I know the right course to take when I'm in a grounded, present, and centered place. And so that's what becomes available to us when we don't only have a hammer. That's deep. Right? That's like people should pay for that on a psychology <laughs> sponsor. That's really deep to be with what is, yeah. not yeah. with what I'm afraid. Man, mm -hmm. I should put that down. Like I, I'm, yeah, I'm afraid of this. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. And that's and that's that's the work. Because when you start learning about your type, I, I don't have time to go into the core fear of each type, but each type has a core fear, right? For my type, it's I'm not enough. That's why I overwork and overperform. I'm not enough. Once I know that that's my core fear, then when I'm sitting with a problem, I already know, oh, I'm not enough is going to cloudy the waters because that's my default fear. Once I notice that, I'll almost like if you're cleaning off like a lake that has all the scum and all the algae on top, it's like, okay, I know that me not being enough is going to cloudy this. I'm just going to scrape it off. And now I can be with what is without having that fear getting in my way. 
And then I'm just reacting from my fear rather than actually being present to what is and making the right choice for myself and others if I'm a leader or, or what have you. Brilliant. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Okay. So going into type six, type six, we have the loyalist or the community builder. I love sixes. Sixes are oriented toward the common good. They're, they're striving to feel supported. Hey, I got your back. You got my back. They're so loyal. They're so, um, they want to trust and they're also cautious to trust, mm -hmm. right? Because if you're going to be a part of a community before you lock in, you want to make sure that these are good people, that this is a good place. Like they ask a lot of questions. They want to make sure that they can trust the leadership and the group. And then they're in, right? I think of sixes as like Navy SEALs. They're like <laughs> always, they're always looking for where could an attack come from? And they're prepared because yeah. they're going to like stand up for and protect their, their people. Yeah. So they have this vigilance about them. Now, of course, if you're always looking for danger, what are you always going to see? Right. So that, that's where it gets overdone. And then if you're always like, there's this phrase, uh, stay ready. So you don't have to get ready, mm -hmm. which is almost like if you're always on high alert, then you never have to get ready. You're just ready to go any, at any moment. The problem is if we're always on alert, it yeah, exhausts your adre adrenal glands. It, it, you never relax. You're never, and actually some of the best fighters, you know, like fight, you know, uh, whether it's jujitsu or whatever, they, they're actually very relaxed until they need to spring into action because the more relaxed the muscles are and the body is, and the, and your core is engaged, then you have the power to jump in. If you're tight, you're, you're dead. Like that's not a good position from which to really react. So for sixes, it's like, if you can find a way to engage and relax and find basic trust, then you can use your vigilance for the common good. And it becomes a beautiful, a beautiful power. The analogy, the analogy of the muscle, like if we could do that with our brains, our minds, yeah. If yeah. our mind needs to be relaxed. So I'm mm -hmm. ready to go. And the reason why I left so, so hard is because behind our cameras here, there's a guy that I, I, you know, uh, generally call him my producer. Like he doesn't like to show up in front of the cameras, but we've been friends mm -hmm. for like five years, six years. And in our community, we have a group that we call it Navy SEALs. Like we're nice. always ready to go and we're ready to mm -hmm. fight for each other. And that's yeah. a number six right there. This guy's a number six, doesn't yeah. care about the cameras. So I'm looking at him behind the cameras <laughs> and I'm like, bro, she's describing you. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Really uh, it's so good. It's, I, I love sixes. Um, all right. So now we have sevens, type sevens. Sevens we call the enthusiasts. And they are, they want everything that life has to offer. Like they just want to squeeze all of the juice out of life. And they're constantly looking for what's new, what's fresh, um, what else can I do and learn? So they're very forward thinking, they're planners, they're visionaries. Um, they never want to do the same thing twice. If, if, you know, if this is good, what's better? Yeah. yeah. Um, usually they have lots of high energy. They're striving to feel this, this excitement, right? They're striving to feel like that crackling of excitement. And so that's great. But when that is overdone, what happens is if you're always in the future, you're never in the present mm -hmm. and true satisfaction and enjoyment and, um, being able to get the juice out of life happens when you stop and you drink deeply. Like there's this, you know, kind of joke that sevens will go to a restaurant and they'll be eating their dinner that they were so looking forward to, but they're thinking about dessert. So they never taste the dinner. Yeah. And so that's the, the invitation for the seven is, can I be present so that I actually feel satisfied rather than constantly chasing the next thing, which leaves me feeling like there's never enough or I have to get more. So that's the balance. I, I love right. my, my side of number seven, but let's go to number eight. <laughs> All right. Nate, now I know you've been waiting for number eight. So <laughs> num, uh, Type eight is called, um, the challenger or the protector. So type eight is striving to feel powerful and, you know, gosh, I wish I had hours and hours to go on with this, but each type represents an essential human quality. And for the type eight, it's the quality of like vitality. 
right? Of, of this power that we all have. We all need to have power and energy to walk, to move, to eat. And eights really embody that power. They're doers. They um, take charge. And actually part of their defense mechanism is I don't want to be controlled. And so I will take charge in order to not be controlled. It's not like they're trying to control others. It's just a way to not be controlled by others. Um, eights value autonomy and independence, kind of like this, don't tell me what to do, uh, mm. because that feels like it's cutting off my power, right? If your agency is your power and someone's telling you what to do, they're cutting off your power. And so that it's a beautiful thing to embody. Um, eights also tend to stick up for those who are powerless, the weak, the ones who are taken advantage of the ones who don't always have, you know, any protection, um, eights tend to want to rise up and, and cover that and, and speak out against injustice and things such as that. Where it becomes overdone is when eights see themselves as the source of power, mm. right? Because there's a higher source of power that eights can work alongside with, but they're not the source. And when eights see themselves as the source, um, then they have to put up walls to protect themselves, right? Because if I'm the source of power, nobody can get to me. I don't want, I don't want to be controlled or betrayed or any of that. When eights sort of have a healthier side, they're able to let the walls down and trust and receive nurturance and receive, which type twos want to give nurturance. So that's where that two and two and eight kind of combo comes together. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the eight. A dangerous type. combination that we, we see a lot today. Uh, at least I see a lot today in the middle of the artistic communities is that like, uh, someone who is an eight and a four at the same time, you know, mm. for power mm -hmm. and the need for uniqueness, you know, I'm mm -hmm. the only one. So yep. it's, it's yep. like Muhammad, Muhammad Ali used to say, like, I'm the greatest. <laughs> yeah. because it takes a lot. It takes a lot to say I'm the greatest. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. And it's one thing to say I'm the greatest because I know myself and I'm tapped into my uniqueness and I'm tapped into my power. And I use that as a pure expression of, you know, who I am in the world. And then it's another thing to, I'm insecure that I'm enough. So I'm going to front that I'm the greatest and I'm going to prove that I'm the greatest. And I'm going to try and make other people believe that I'm the greatest. Cause I don't know that I believe it myself. Yeah. And there's kind of it, a difference and you feel it like you feel it when somebody walks in and they're just in this calm, grounded confidence mm -hmm. versus when someone walks in and they're trying to make you think they're confident. And it's, it's, it's a different energy. It creates like in my experience, it creates repulsion if it's insecure. Yes. Yeah. But then it creates admiration if it's self aware yes. Like, okay, yes. I admire that person because I can see it. So yeah. 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 And one thing that eights are great at is they can smell inauthenticity a mile away, mm -hmm. right? Like if someone is coming in and has an agenda or isn't being authentic or has like something that they're hiding or that's not fully whatever. I mean, eights have this, just this radar. That's just like, no, <laughs> like, no. Um, yeah. All right. Finally, eights, nine. Eights are <laughs> they are great. I love, I am obsessed with eights. <laughs> they're great. They are great. <laughs> um, finally we get to nines. And nines, we call the peacemaker. Um, nines, if you look at the Enneagram symbol, they sit right at the top of the circle. And they kind of sit at the top and look down over all the types. And they see the world from everyone's perspective. Nines have this way of reconciling. You know what? I understand you. And I see what you're saying. And I understand this person. And we haven't heard that perspective. And they want to pull everyone in and find some sort of balance find some sort of peace yeah. within all of the chaos. And that's a beautiful gift that they bring to the world. Their virtue is love, this unconditional love that we all belong. Like even the circle of the Enneagram is sort of the symbol of like oneness. Mm -hmm. We all belong. We're standing on different points, but we're connected. And nines just know that intrinsically. What happens is though, when they overdo this, there's not enough peace, their reaction is, well, then I must try to erase myself and push myself away and push myself down and almost disappear so that I don't make waves, so that I don't disrupt the peace, I'm going to not show up. Mm. And when that happens, nines actually experience disconnection yeah. and they experience internal chaos. 
And it actually doesn't help them feel more peaceful to try and minimize, you know, there's a difference between a peacemaker and a peace faker. Wow. Right. I can try to like pretend that it doesn't bother me and say, Oh no, I'm fine. And keep the peace. But if inside it bothers me, I'm not being truthful and that's not true peace. Mm. Right. And so every type kind of sacrifices the truth of who they are, true peace for fake peace. Mm. You know, eights can sacrifice true power for fake power and the fronting of power. Mm-hmm. All, all of, all of the types we we're tempted to settle for something that isn't actually true and real. And that can happen for type nines. Yeah. So, so that's a quick overview of all the types. That was beautiful. Uh, yeah, that's beautiful. That was beautiful. I'm pretty sure that like, we'll, we'll make sure that we put your, your channel there and for people to get in touch to have their, you know, yeah. individual consultancy or something, because like, I, I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get a group of people and then we, we're going to hire you at some point. Yeah. I don't know when, at some yeah. point, like, okay, teach us all that because the cohesiveness that we can create in the team, man. Yeah. Just yeah. amazing. Oh, it's so powerful, especially when we find respect for other types. Mm. So oftentimes, you know, I'm standing on my point of point three and you're standing on your point of point eight and threes and eights can have a little friction sometimes. I'm not going to lie, but if I'm standing on my point and I'm looking at you and I'm like, why do you do things that way? I would never do things that way. Why do you say it that way? That doesn't make sense to me. We can get defensive when we don't understand what other people are bringing to the table. Mm. Right. And so part of the work is there's no one type that's better than the other. And every type has something to bring. And when we find respect for each of the types and not just respect, but when we understand how each type shows up in their healthiest way, then we can both respect the person and we can call each other out and call each other in like my type eight best friend who who knows that I will image craft and will say, Hey, that's not really you. And she's not trying to be rude. She's just calling me to my highest, my highest self. And she's telling me you are sacrificing your truth for acceptance. Mm. And you are not going to be happy with that. And I'll do the same for her in her type eight. This I'll say, Hey, are you, you're, you're putting out a lot of power right now. Are you actually afraid? Where's all this power that's radiating off of you coming from? Let me in, like lower those walls, let me in. And because we know each other, we know how we work. It's beautiful. I I wonder how these conversations might go for long, man. These might be amazing conversations. (laughs) (laughs) It's like Freud and Nietzsche having conversations. Like uh, I can see your brain waves, bro. Like, (laughs) yep. That's awesome. Yep. While you were describing, like I'm, I'm fascinated by everything you've said so far. Like, I don't even know where to start, but uh, (laughs) when, when you were around number six, I, I had this thing in my mind because I was, you know, people were coming to my mind, the people that I work with, the people that are close to me. And um, I remember that on the Enneagram diagram, if we can use that word, the circle, they're connected in a certain way, like very specific Mm -hmm. from one number to another. Like Mm -hmm. I genuinely, I don't know if that means like my, my primary one, my secondary one. I I don't know. I'd love Mm -hmm. for you to explain that if there is any connection there, but Mm -hmm. why are they, if you, if you know, I don't know if that's to be known, but why are they connected this way? Like, why do I have my traits or, eight, one and seven or eight, seven and one. I'm not really sure what comes first for me, but why do they follow these patterns? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So the inter, the lines within the circle, um, there are two sets. There's an inner triangle that connects nine, three and six. And then there's an inner crown that connects all the rest. One, two, four, eight, seven, five. Um, And there is a very specific reason why these lines are there. And it kind of, we spoke on it a little bit earlier. It has to do with the primary strategy that we have and then what strategies we employ when that primary strategy breaks down for us. And the way it works out is actually really beautiful because the strategies that we go to um, when our primary isn't working are usually these balancing strategies. So for example, I'll use your type, uh, the type eight. when type eights who typically are have a lot of power and are moving forward and are really engaged in the world, um, when that isn't working, 
Eights will actually go to type five. That's the line that you're connected to and kind of pull their energy back and contemplate and go into their head and try to find some clarity and try to strategize. Eights typically are do first, think later, right? They're very action oriented. Mm -hmm. And so when they move to five, they move from this doing energy into a more contemplative space, into a little bit of a quieter space. They pull their energy in. And so we can see how that's a great balance. Um, if we overdo... It's, also, it's like proof. That's my calculation. Yes. All my yes. days written down. Like this. <laughs> yeah. And it's actually, once we recognize where our balancing strategy is and what it is, you can start using it intentionally. Right? Mm -hmm. You can start building into your schedule days where you might need some solitude, which it doesn't always feel comfortable to go to that because our natural type is just like, oh, I feel kind of uncomfortable being alone or, but it also feels refreshing at times. So it's one of those things where it's not always comfortable. I don't want to live there, but it feels refreshing every once in a while to not have to be carrying the load. Eight tend to carry a lot, yeah. right? So to not have to be carrying the load and just kind of detach for a minute and come in and think and strategize. There's like this quietness that is needed to then re-engage into yeah. your type structure what, again. What happens to me is I love to go to the mountains, like this this little house in the mm -hmm. mountains that we go every now and again, mm -hmm. for 48 hours. And then I got to yeah. be back. You know? Exactly. <laughs> go, exactly. 48 hours, fast forward, let's go. Let's hit the ground. Yes. Again. yes. Whereas a type five might actually love to live there. Mm. Right. They might actually love to just like live there permanently. But for an eight, yeah. you're going to go there for a temporary time, refresh and then come back. Which is come weird, back. like how we interpret stuff like, uh, you know, I, I, I work with the, the faith community and um, sometimes I struggle to understand why people would live in a city with 3000 people. You know, like I, mm -hmm. I, I go mm -hmm. like, well, are these people like, obviously, I don't want to offend anyone, but are these people sick? Like they didn't. There's not a shopping mall in the city. What's wrong with these people? You know, but yeah. at the same yeah. time, they look at me like, this guy is nuts. Like he's running at such a pace that he's going to die at 40. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know? So yes. the way we interpret things, mm -hmm. like you said, connected to our personalities, yeah. what we go to first. And yeah. now can we change that? Is, is it changeable or are we doomed? Like, am I, am I doomed for that personality? Can I train to be a little bit of number two and a little bit of number nine, maybe? Yeah. Well, you can definitely expand your toolkit. And we were, you know, we were talking about different tools that we use. So you can expand your toolkit, but you're always going to have your primary tool oh, just because of the way the brain works. When we repeated these patterns so many times, it creates these neural pathways that literally creates physical folds and crevices in the brain that is, you can't undo. You can build new ones, but you can't undo. And so that will always be your primary. What's what's great is though, there's nothing wrong with that, right? Every there's type. A lot of things wrong with me, Vanessa. Well, <laughs> but but the pattern itself is not necessarily a bad thing. It's only when it becomes, like I said, that compulsion. Yeah. And when it becomes this default reaction and this default fear, and we're not able to be with what is and move from a place of right action. Yeah. So it's, it's more of maturing to manage the patterns when we're immature. And especially, you know, when we're young, our patterns are running the show. Like, I don't mm. know if you have kids, but I've got four kids and they're just, they're just going from like, chaos and instinct, right? They're, they're being ruled by all of their desires and passions and what have you. And that's fine. They're kids. When you grow up, you still feel angry, hungry, um, whatever, but you don't run into the fridge and stuff your face. Well, I mean, maybe sometimes we do, but you know, <laughs> we have a little bit more mastery over these impulses because we've matured. Yeah. It's the same with the patterns. The, we're still going to feel the tug of our patterns, but as we mature, we become more um, managing them rather than them running the show without us being aware. You know, every parent should should get some sort of awareness of the Enneagram, I think, especially for their kids. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if, you, if you've if you come across 
uh, patients. Do you call them patients or clients or customers? Clients, clients, yeah. Because uh, I remember about two years ago, my daughter was nine and she was starting to to show her personality in a more vivid way. Uh, mm -hmm. She's very dramatic, my first one. The second one is just like me. She's bold. She doesn't care. She kicks everyone. So it's just, I, I mean, <laughs> I created a monster. But uh, I, I took my oldest daughter and I set her in front of the computer and we did one of those simple Enneagram tests. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I was helping her to answer the questions. She didn't know the answer to all the questions. But mm -hmm. I... You know, according to what I saw in her, and and then I realized that you know when, believe it or not, she she's scared of the wind. She she's scared of the wind and, and rain. Like she panics. Mm -hmm. And my natural reaction, my natural reaction to anyone like that would be like, grow up, man. It's just water. It's just wind. Just just rain. Mm -hmm. And I did it in the beginning, and then mm -hmm. I realized that well, what she needed was a little bit of affirmation and a little bit of safety. And yeah. if I can be that person now, even though it is very uncomfortable for me, yeah. if I can be that person now, should be all right. And mm -hmm. you know that's how I've been doing. So, mm -hmm. and parents, yeah. If parents oh my gosh! Find Vanessa, please. <laughs> yeah, will be much better off because of that. It's you know it's really amazing how our children will reflect back to us parts of ourselves that we either are uncomfortable with or have rejected. Mm. And for every Enneagram type, there is something that we reject or that we can't be, right? If I, if I have to be successful, I can't be a failure or I can't be a big one for me as a victim. No, no, no. I will, you know, do what I need to do and I'm not a victim and everything is in my control. If I just work hard enough, so when I see one of my children who is, who is feeling like I need help, help me, you know, like, like this, they're not being a victim, they're being a yeah. child, but it's hard for me to be with, I, I just want to be like, what do you mean you need help? Figure it out. Like, yeah. like I see my own internal, cause that's how I speak to myself. What do you mean you need help? Figure it out. You can't ask for anyone's help. You're, you got to do it by yourself. And when I start noticing like, Oh that's my type structure trying to protect me. But man, now I can't really be with my child in a holistic, compassionate way because I'm not comfortable needing help. Yeah. So it really is like a beautiful way to start asking ourselves, okay, the things that bother me in my kids or in anyone, um, why does it bother me? And is it because I don't let myself be needy or ask for help? or be weak, or be afraid, right? For type eight, there's a lot of denial of fear. Like, I'm not afraid. Yeah. I'm afraid of anything. You shouldn't be afraid of anything either. And what's really true is, no, everyone is afraid. But if I see myself as being afraid, then how can I see myself as powerful? Exactly. So it creates this, like, space to just start saying, okay, am I really being a full human? Or am I cutting off parts of my humanity because I just have to be this in order to, again, that mask, like, I have to be this to make my way in the world. Super hard. It's so hard. It is so hard. It is. I wonder, like, I, I'm very curious of how your session goes with your clients because <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I don't expect anyone to have that solved in one session. Honestly, no. Like, no. This is probably worse than going to the psychoanalyst. <laughs> oh man, it's really oh, beautiful man. though. There's so much things to be treated in my head just because of what you just said, like you know how you face yeah. your fears, how you. Yeah. Look in the mirror when you're supposed to be looking at someone else's eyes instead of looking in the mirror because they're not listening to you. They, they're not you. Mm -hmm. Man, mm -hmm. it's so good. So good. It is really deep. And so, yeah, I only do three month minimums with people. I'm like, all right, if we're working together, there you, you got me for three months because sure. that's, we have to, you know, it takes time. But a lot of the work that we do is twofold. First, it's called radical inclusivity, which means all the parts of us get to be here. Mm -hmm. And we may not, they may not be serving us. So I can say, okay, this part of me that just wants to impress everyone, it's not serving me, but it gets to be here because it was, it, it was developed within me for a reason, right? As a child, if I didn't impress my parents, they didn't pay attention to me. Yeah. And as a child, if we don't have attachment to our parents, we don't survive. It's like this primitive thing in our brain. Of like, I have to be attached or they're not going to feed me. They're not going to protect me. It's, it's a very, you know, primitive thing. So, okay. I hate that part of me in one sense that like needs to impress. Cause I'm like, come on, just like be yourself. 
And then on the other side, I say, yeah, I see you. You were trying to keep me safe. You were developed for a reason. So you get to be here and I get to listen to you and I get to work with you. And then again, that maturity, but you're not going to run the show anymore. Mm. I'm not going to be driven by my compulsion to impress everyone anymore because it doesn't serve me. And now I'm the adult. Yeah. So, so it's a lot of like, what parts of yourself do you hate? And let's look at that and let's try and see if we can find some compassion to let it all mm. be here and then become the parent, the grown up that says, mm. yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to let that rule, but yeah, I do. I, I don't think I've ever had the chance to do anything like that. So immersive, like to find out what's, you know, the, the bad parts, the wrong parts. So yeah. I've always looked at, okay, this is the positive work with this and mm -hmm. let's forget the rest. You know, they, they will yeah. disappear at some point. And yeah. man, you, you're so easy to talk to because you, you basically ruined my interview, basically, because <laughs> I had it all written down with the questions and it's just <laughs> going like, it's it's so easy to, to talk to you. Yeah. I was about to ask you about uh, like your, your ch not your childhood, but our childhood. Like, mm -hmm. uh, do you think these traits, you know, number, uh, number nine, number eight, whatever number people come up to be when they're adults, are they developed by just our environment? So are we born with this? Is it natural? Because I know my, um, well, there's something. Can you still hear me? Connection went off at some point. Yeah. We're back. We're back. Are you back? We're back. I see you. Cool. Yeah, right. I'm here. Yeah, so I was about to ask, um, what's, what's the role of this childhood development? Is it your parents that, and, you know, stir that up in you or do you inherit that on your dna uh, if you're never trained is is it still going to turn out to be the same thing like how, how do you see that mm -hmm. yeah it's there's a lot of debate around this um you know what comes first the chicken or the egg like are you born your type or do you become your type like how does all that work what i my theory and i may be wrong um but my theory is that we we have to take some form as we are becoming, you know, as we're growing up, like we have to make decisions at some point. If I need milk, am I going to cry or am I just going to say, well, no one's coming and not cry. Like at some point we have to make a decision. How do I get my needs met? Mm. And, and so we take a form and that's okay. We, again, these defense mechanisms, we need them at least initially to make our way through the world. So I don't necessarily see it as like a bad thing that we all have a type. We had to have a type. But what I have found to be true just in the world, in nature, in faith, in spirituality, is there's this constant movement of birth, death, resurrection. Birth, death, resurrection. So as we have our form, it's like, okay, I, I'm born. I, I have this form. I have this type. And then we kind of are like, it's not serving me anymore. So we, we work with it to see if it can fall away. And then what reemerges is someone who has greater mastery over their type, someone who, you know, is more conscious. And then of course we see, oh, wait a minute, maybe I'm not as conscious as I thought I was. Um, they're still lingering, right? We're never done. There's always more to be done, but it's almost like this form and then it shatters and then it reforms and then it shatters and then it reforms. And it's this constant becoming like, it's not a bad thing that we have a type and then we want to let it go. And then we find that it's actually still there. And then we keep going. It's, it's just sort of this process of life, death, rebirth, uh, over and over again. Um, so I don't know if that really answers your question, but yeah, it's definitely a part of our childhood, but it's kind of an unavoidable one. Whether you had trauma as a child or not, you had to take a form. Yeah. You had to choose how you were going to show up in the world. We all made our choices. And then that got constricting. Yeah. It's like a box that's too small. Now I want to expand. Yeah. The, the reason why I asked is because obviously, you know, it's very common these days. People talk about childhood traumas and they define mm -hmm. you and all mm -hmm. that. But in my case, especially uh, because I've got two kids and, mm -hmm. and I see how different they are. You know, one is mm -hmm. 11, the other one's three. And mm -hmm. Like if, if it was a, a straight line, one would be a one and the other one would be a nine. <laughs> if it yeah. was a straight line, like so different they are. And yep. I'm, I'm asking myself all the time, where did that come from? Because yeah. I mean, 
I know that one. If I looked that one in the eyes, it's like, I know that one. That came from me. But mm -hmm. the other one, like, well, I don't know where you yeah. came from. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, they do, they do have, they have done studies where babies are just born with a temperament. Right. And there's kind of three temperaments. Yeah. And so some theorists in the Enneagram world say that there's, you know, there's nine types that are lumped into three triads. That's the main so maybe, right. So maybe you're born a temperament and then depending on how life interacts with you, you settle into one of the three types within your temperament. Cause yeah, people are definitely born with some sort of something. I mean, you yeah. just know, as soon as my kids were born, they each had a different they're not blank. way of, they're not blank. It's, no, they're not blank at all. And I think what happens to us in our life affects how we, how we are formed as well. So it's probably a mixture of the two. And, um, and it's actually interesting because for some, what's traumatic or what's wounding or what's, you know, hard for kids to deal with, you could treat your kids the exact same way. Like, let's say, for example, a type two who wants to be seen and loved and taken care of, you know, you could tie their shoe for them and they would be like, oh, I feel so seen and loved and taken care of. A type five who wants to be independent and do everything themselves, you tie their shoe and they feel like, oh, they don't think I can do it by myself. They're treating me like a baby. So it's not really like wounding happens almost whether we're trying to or not, just because it's not just what happened. It's how the person is interpreting what happened. Exactly. That's what actually impacts that person. And that's what we can't control. So as parents, it's really hard sometimes to do this work, but you just got to say like, I'm doing my best. Yeah. I'm going to wound my kids and I'll just be there to love them through whatever they need to heal through because that's all we can and do. And that's why I thought it was so important what you said in the beginning of this conversation, like just be with what is. Yeah. And that was yeah. so deep. Like, I, I'm not sure if you know how deep that was. <laughs> <laughs> just be with what is and let the other, like, yeah. I'm, yeah. yeah, I'm mesmerized by that. But <laughs> to, like, I, I know 99% of the people who are going to watch this are adults already. Although mm -hmm. it's a fascinating conversation about kids. I'm loving it. I could stay here forever. Um, mm -hmm. But let's jump into something that I, I think they will, they will get value out of this. And maybe it's a good uh, point for them to be curious about the Enneagram. I wanted to ask you about the, the professional life. You know, um, mm -hmm. you're a coach. You, you train mm -hmm. teams, you train companies, businesses, churches, like mm -hmm. you said. Um, so in the professional realm, how, I mean, obviously, we would have to go through three months of consulting with you until we find out. But <laughs> how would you go, like, in, in, in a simple conversation, how would you tell people that the Enneagram is beneficial for them? Like, understanding who they are, understanding how mm -hmm. to relate to people in the workplace. Like, what, mm -hmm. what is the benefit of being yeah. there of all that? So first of all, just having the awareness that when we are not feeling safe, when we are not feeling seen, when we are not feeling heard, our defense mechanism is going to show up that much stronger. So when I don't feel secure in a relationship, I'm like, I better impress the heck out of this person. And my defense mechanism is huge. When I feel safe with someone, I'm like, you know what? I am who I am. You know, it is what it is. I'm not going to try and and impress this person. And that's true for all the types. Type ones are extremely perfectionist when they don't feel safe. Um, type fives are really going to withdraw and not engage when they don't feel safe. What happens is if you have a team of people who don't feel safe and all of their defense mechanisms are up, it's like all of these spikes out and trying to get work done and people are closed off and they're not being authentic. They're not being curious. They're not being truthful. You can't get work done not real deep creative, you know, a lot of these companies are trying to do big things. They're trying to innovate innovation, doing big things requires vulnerability risk. It requires thinking outside the box. Nobody's going to do that if they're armored up. Mm. So the first step to having a really beautiful collaborative team that works well together is how do we build trust? And the first step of building trust is we have to actually speak what is true and hear other people from their perspective, not through our own filter. So when we know our Enneagram type, it starts to decode, right? Like when, when a type five doesn't want to go out to happy hour afterwards, it's not because they hate you. It's not because they don't want to engage with the group or whatever. It's because 
they want to process mentally everything that has happened that day. They That's their people. superpower. And they're, yeah, they're just done with people. It's nothing personal. Yeah. And so it doesn't have to erode the team culture. In fact, you can celebrate what that type five brings to the team because they're going to think of things that you would never think of because you were out at drinks having a blast, right? So you start to see people, again, for who they are, mm -hmm. rather than interpreting their actions through your logic and judging that they are X, Y, and Z. Yeah. All of those judgments just get in the way of really being with each other and having that cohesion. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the ways, there's many, but that's one of the ways that working with Enneagram in teams is really helpful. When you were describing their part, um, I don't know, are, are you, uh, you like reading a lot or mm -hmm. how much? Okay. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't know if you've had the chance of, uh, to read a book called uh, Leaders Eat Less by Simon Sinek. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. describes those circles, you know, like yep. the job of a leader is to make everyone safe because yes. safe. And yes. I mean, he probably got some sort of Enneagram understanding. I, I would think uh, he mm -hmm. understands the mind of the, the human being pretty mm -hmm. well. And yeah. it's basically what you just said. You know, if I know yeah. this guy's a number five and he, right. he just wants to retreat a little bit, okay, let him go. Now make mm -hmm. him safe and it, it's best for everyone. Yeah. And, and what's tricky, in fact, one of my most popular sort of presentations that I do for corporations yeah. is um, how to ensure the psychological safety of each type. Because what's tricky is it's not a one size fits all. Mm. As a leader, you can't just come in and say, well, we're going to have a pizza party after work and then everyone will feel safe with each other because we spent time together and we relationship built. Mm. Well, maybe if you're a type six, that makes sense right? We're going to hang out and that'll be relationship building for other types that doesn't make them feel safe. Yeah. So knowing what makes each type feel safe is really important because then you can say, okay, for this type, they need this for this type, they need that. And it really helps, um, just to meet people where they're at uh, on their own level. Cause it, it doesn't make sense if I'm like, yeah, I created a really safe environment, but I only created a safe environment for people who think like me. Yeah. I think that understanding, uh, you know, first who you are and how you react to things and second, how other people around you behave and, and understand the world. Um, if there is another book that I love, it's called the 48 laws of power, really dark mm -hmm. book though. Uh, mm -hmm. by Robert Greene. It's really dark. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't recommend anyone who's a, like <laughs> hard, uh, faint hearted to read it. Cause it's, it's yeah. weird. But, um, if Robert Greene was writing that book today, he would say it's important for you to understand the numbers of the people that work with you, especially your boss, so you can get a raise. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, you understand how you please your boss. Yeah, yeah. And that's another thing is understanding what people prioritize. You know, um, some people, for example, I, I, you know, type nines, if, if you were to work with them, they usually like to have a little bit of chit chat before we get into business, right? Yeah. Like, Hey, how are your kids? What's going on? Da, 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 da. Okay. So now let's get into business. Type threes on the other hand, uh, are very concerned with efficiency. So they prefer you just come in, tell me what's up, tell me what you need, tell me what we're doing. Yeah. And, and then I'll see you later. And I'm perfectly fine with that. But a type nine would be like, Oh, that's kind of rude. Like that mm. didn't feel good to me. That didn't, and so, yeah, understanding what different types prioritize yeah. can also be helpful. And, you know, sometimes we can't, it's not necessarily to manipulate people and it's not to cater to everyone, but sometimes you can't take the extra time to have the chit chat or sometimes, you know, you're not going to cater to everyone, but you can at least verbalize, Hey, I know that you prefer for us to chit chat a bit. I'm short on time. Can I just cut to the chase? Yeah. And so sometimes even just knowing that like, Hey, I, I know what you would prefer. And I wish I could give that to you. I can't right now. Even just that little bit makes that person feel like you're considering them, even if you can't make it work for them to have everything yeah. they want. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. And talking about that, I know you're very short on time and you're yeah. concerned with efficiency. <laughs> So let's jump to this because I, I don't want to leave this outside. Like I know we, we talked a little bit before and obviously if you don't want to go that deep, um, I'm, ha I'm happy to jump ahead, but I'm really curious with the, the spiritual side of things, you know, um, mm -hmm. we don't need to get into details and I mean, mm -hmm. we respect all types of faith and that's not the question here, but 
Um, every time I talk to someone who has any kind of faith, it doesn't matter what kind of religion they follow, uh, Enneagram is something kind of obscure. They like, mm -hmm. oh, this is too mystic, you know, like it's, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know where it comes from. And yeah. most of these people are insecure because they, they're ignorant. They don't know what they're talking about. And so I, I just wanted to get your perspective, like how, mm -hmm. how are they connected? Obviously you don't need to expose yourself, but how do you think they're connected uh, since you work yeah. in churches, how you've seen that those results and yeah. then we can jump to uh, the end of our talk. Yeah. I, there is a big spiritual component to the Enneagram and it is mystical at times. And, and it really, there's multiple layers. So I, a lot of churches can take, you know, who are traditional Christian churches can take the Enneagram and, you know, it, it translates because one body, many parts, right? We're all one in Christ, but we have different, different gifts. We serve different functions. The arm is not the leg and the eye is not the, the ear. So that concept is not foreign um, and that all parts belong and that all parts should be honored because they all bring something different and that the head is not better than the body, right? So there's not really, at least the way that I see it, I don't see a lot of friction between Enneagram teaching and, and any faith really, depending on how you take it. Now, a lot of the roots of it are rooted in some of the concepts I was speaking about, like radical inclusivity, right? That all of my parts within me belong, which is kind of contradictory to a traditional Christian. Like I've got a sinful nature that I have to put to death. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, the way I see it is there's no framework that is perfect. Mm -hmm. Some frameworks are helpful. And so if you can sit with a framework and pull out what resonates according to your faith, and it's helpful to you, and it feels like it rings true, then use it. And if there are parts that feel not congruent to your faith, you can let them go. Mm. Um, but yeah, there are, there are some mystical roots to the Enneagram, and because there's so much just sort of basic truth to it, uh, like, you know, if you read a Simon Sinek book, he's not necessarily a Christian person, but you resonate with some truths. And even the truths you resonate with, you probably find in scripture, right? That when you see things overlapping in different environments, you're kind of like, that feels like it's probably true, true. Mm. And then people can take it further into their own you know, niche sort of spiritual beliefs. And maybe that feels less true to you. So I kind of like people to boil it down to the common denominator and take what works for them. With, with your experience, um, I can see like you, you have so many pearls, like you just said, no, no framework is perfect, mm -hmm. but they're helpful. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I just love the way you put it. So maybe for us to finish this, cause we run out of time again, um, maybe for us to finish this, cause I don't, I don't want to get you like, I, I, I want people to look for you. I want people to. Mm -hmm to to be interested in your work as much as i yeah. can because it it's really valuable but um no framework's perfect but they're helpful how mm -hmm. do you how do you overcome the parts that are not helpful like if your framework's not mm -hmm. perfect you work with the enneagram and then you find mm -hmm. the client and the client is like i can't figure this guy out i, I don't know mm -hmm. i'm just i'm just guessing can't figure yeah. this guy out don't find this I, I can't i don't have a problem do you give up? What, what do you do? Like, how do you, Vanessa, go out and look for the extra part that's not in your framework? How do you, or how yeah. do you become content with, okay, I don't have an answer. Stuff it. Yeah. Next. Yeah. No, I never try to force the Enneagram on anyone. And I've had some clients who say, I don't know that I find that I know what my type is. And I'm like, great. You don't have to know what your type is to begin to get curious around why you do what you do. So tell me about a pattern in your life that keeps coming back over and over again. Mm. Oh, well, my mom, she always calls me up and I feel like I have to help her. And then I resent her and da, 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 da. And it happens over and over again. Okay, great. I don't know what your type is. You don't know what your type is, but we know that this is a pattern. So what makes you feel compelled to do that? Um, how do you feel in your body when you're doing that? And we just dig in, we just dig in and we just get curious and we just start investigating what is contributing to this. Because oftentimes we don't ask ourselves those questions. Mm -hmm. We're distracted with the resentment that we're feeling, or we're distracted with all of the surfacey things. But when you actually sink in and you say, okay, what are the stories you're telling yourself? What if you didn't help your mom? Oh, well, then I'd be a bad person. And then I would be a bad daughter. And then I would have all this stuff. Okay. Is that true? 
And what about taking care of yourself? And, and, and so there's just like a million ways that we could go, even if someone doesn't know their type. And typically what happens, the more curious we are in the deeper conversations we have, we find their type. Okay. But sometimes we're not going to start with, well, we got to know your type right now. We're going to force this to work. I don't believe in forcing anything to work mm. as we explore things will emerge mm. and we will find things that are helpful and we will work with what is here. And sometimes I have clients who are very closed off and resistant and that's okay too. They're just not ready. And sometimes I, I, I like fire clients and I don't fire them, but I, I'm like, <laughs> Is this, is this feeling like it's supporting you in your work? And sometimes they're like, no, and I can feel it. They're pushing back. And I'm like, that's fine. Like, go find something that does work. Go find something that is going to support you because forcing things is just never in my experience. And I am definitely a forcer. Cause I'm just like, Whoa, let's go. We're going to make it happen. It just doesn't always actually lead to authenticity. It leads to us forcing a specific outcome, which then cuts us off from what is actually here. Again, being with what's here. Yeah. How do I be with what's here? If I've got a predetermined outcome that I'm trying to make happen, yeah. it's, never it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Yeah. Now, yeah. When people come looking for you, as we, as we approach the end of this conversation, as, as much as I feel sad about this, because I could stay here the whole time. <laughs> um, when people look for you, would you rather that they come ready, like they've taken a test? Do you have a test that you recommend that people will go like, okay, this is this is who I am and I want to mm -hmm. learn more? Or should they just come raw and mm -hmm. see what happens? Yeah. Yeah. So I do have a free uh, typing resource. It's not a test because I don't believe in tests. So it's a 15-minute it's a video where I ask three questions and then you kind of work through those three questions and at the end... Uh, should have a good idea of what your type is. And then That's I also have these popular one on your, on your channel, isn't it? Yeah. I'm yeah, asking. it is. And mm -hmm. I'm like, this girl's a yeah. genius because she feels <laughs> out with three questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, no test, including my own is a hundred percent accurate because we're just complex humans, but it, it helps give a good ballpark. And then, um, I have these one page PDFs of each type that if you're between a couple types, you can just download, they're free. You can just download those PDFs and read through them. And you might feel like, oh, now that I read this, this is what resonates or that's what resonates. So, but then I also do typing sessions um, where I sit down with someone and we talk for, you know, 30 minutes or so. And as I ask them questions, again, usually what emerges is I just reflect back. This is what I'm hearing. This is what it sounds like to me. Outcome? Like in, in one in one simple sentence, what's the outcome? Like if I look for you, what do I get out of this? When we when we hire you, what do we get out of this? Yeah. So what you get out of it is increased self-awareness, understanding your patterns, increased self-compassion for why those patterns are there, and then a map toward liberation, right? A map toward increasing the number of tools that you have so you're not stuck in the compulsion of your type but you feel equipped to expand beyond it and know what other tools might be necessary or helpful in whatever situation you're in. So in other words, you take the pill from pinky and the brain and you're ready to take over the world. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. Now, um, is the website the best place for people to find you um, go on your website and then they have these resources or would you like to recommend anything else? Yeah. Website is best. The Enneagram workshop.com. And then my YouTube channel. I, I love, I have a couple of videos that I'm working on to get up a couple more things up there. It's just youtube.com backslash the Enneagram workshop. So, Brilliant. um, yeah. Brilliant. Well, when this has been really, really interesting, like, again, I, I, I won't say enough. I could stay here for another five hours at least. Uh, each of these questions, they had so many different levels that we can go on to. I'm really appreciative. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, would you like to say anything else before we finish for your viewers? Um, this is going to be partially on the YouTube channel, partially on a different platform. But if you have any message that you want to give to people, that's uh, less, yeah. your less sayings, <laughs> your parting, parting sayings. <laughs> yeah, no, it's been a pleasure to talk with you and... I get, I could, I mean, it's what I get paid to do. So I definitely could talk about this all day, but, um, my only parting words would just be, um, to be gentle with yourself on this journey. You know, it, it can be 
a hard journey. I know you focus a lot on finding purpose and finding, you know, what it is that you're meant to do. And that can be a frustrating and long and sometimes dark journey as you face parts of yourself. So I would just say, be gentle with yourself along the way, because, um, there's so much greatness and we're so addicted to looking for what's wrong. Mm. We're so addicted to looking for what I need to improve or change or fix. And yeah, that's all there. And that'll all get taken care of. Um, but as much compassion and kindness and gentleness that you can have with yourself, um, that would be my encouragement. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. We ended very well. Thank you again, Vanessa. Absolutely. Thank you enough. Uh, please thank of your family course. for me, your husband in the yeah. kids. For yeah, you stay this long, you know. <laughs> yes. And, um, hopefully we'll talk again in the future and have more feedbacks about this. And who knows? Perfect. My cross our pets and have our teams trained and understand the Enneagram. It's going to be a pleasure. Sounds good. Yeah.